But I would say this, when we're talking about recovering from cancer treatment, we're talking about years here. Nobody tells you that, really. But you need to know that it's a long, long time. Much longer than we want it to be. We're talking about healing all sorts of different parts of your body. Maybe not just the cancer sites, but all the other things, medical interventions that have to be done also have to heal. A little surgery here, a little something there, a little take that port out, whatever it is. You're healing from the toxic drugs that you may have to take. And I don't, no one would ever really answer me about that one. How long is it gonna take? Well, it's different for everybody. And then you got a broken heart too. You gotta heal that up somehow. And that takes, all of those things keep coming back for years. It's not just, well, when, when are you cancer free? Or where, when, when is it over? Oh, it's over, yay, it's over. It's been three years, it's been whatever. Because all of, it's like a country song, really. <laughs> they talk about, oh, a certain melody or a certain smell brings it back. Well, all the parts of your life bring back cancer to you, and you have to heal from all of that every time one of those little snippets comes out and touches the cancer part of your broken heart. So plan on a really long time. <laughs> so thank you for raising the issue about the broken heart. Yes, that's something that, that um, is can be different for everyone in so many ways. Um, you know, suffering I've always understood as being related to losses. And part of it is loss of self-image. Uh, part of it can be loss of function. Part of it also can be that our loss of sense of invulnerability. And as my body has betrayed me, how could this happen? Um, this isn't fair. Um, Oh, my left toe has been aching for two days now. Oh no, it's back. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, these are things that, when you talk about the broken heart, um, uh, that's why I think this uh, really cancer survivorship and co-survivorship is so much about the heart. Now, some practical things along that line is that there are really good cancer rehabilitation Rehabilitation people here in town. Um, there's, pro, there's, a, there's a national um, standardizing organization called STAR, um, which I'm not, uh, I don't, I can't recall exactly what it stands for, but uh, it's out of um, out of a uh, rehab um, a team at um, at Harvard Spalding Hospital. Um, and part of that is to really kind of look at overall function. It includes lymphedema issues, it includes sexuality issues, and, um, uh, and so there are a lot of things about the um, morbidity-related issues of, of treatment um, that uh, can be addressed. And it's a whole area of specialty in medicine uh, in order to, to do so. And so I think that that is um, something that is going to be very important. I just have to say about detox. Detox is a hot topic these days. And, um, and it's true uh, that there is much we can do to support our body's detoxification pathways. Number one, cruciferous vegetables. Think of broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, rutabaga, arugula, watercress, these are all very supportive of our body's capacity to detoxify. Um, and it's really important to have those things on board um, because um, detoxification actually is a two-step process. And they support the second step. If you have really good functioning first step and not so good functioning second step, that's a bad thing. We don't want that. Example, Tylenol. Tylenol is a safe drug by itself, but it actually gets transformed by the liver into a toxin that by its first step. And it needs a second step to get past that. It also needs a lot of something called glutathione, a 
body's largest natural antioxidant. If we are low in glutathione and low in second phase detoxification capacity, we get Tylenol toxicity. Hmm. So that's really something to know. People on high dose Tylenol long periods of time is not a good thing unless we can ensure good glutathione and good second phase detoxification pathway function. We can look at first phase detoxification pathway through genomics now, and these are called the P450s, the CYP enzymes. And they go by names like 2D6 and 3A4 and 1A1 and 1A2 and 1B1 and, and the like. Um, 2D6 is a really important one for us to know about um, because it is involved in turning tamoxifen into an active drug. We don't have good 2D6 function. Tamoxifen does not get turned into a good drug. Uh, codeine does not get turned into morphine. And the list goes on and on. And so we now have the capacity to do it. It's cheap. It's $99 from 23andMe. Um, and uh, an additional $20 for a kind of an organizing website uh, um, like livewello.com. We can talk about that more uh, later, but these are things that, this is, the, when we talk about next generation medicine, this fact that it, uh, this is something cheap and easy to do and something we all will be doing, um, it'll be standard of care, um, but right now, uh, unfortunately, it, it isn't, but it's in your power to do the best $99 one can spend, I think, in, in health care right now after vitamin D. And, uh, um, and so it gives us good insight on how to customize and personalize an approach uh, for people. Uh, what are some of the most pressing needs of cancer patients or cancer survivors? I can say for as a caregiver and now living with two children without their dad, um, counseling. Um, mental health from the second he was diagnosed and you know I heard heard those words it changed our lives forever um, and it's it's everybody it's the patient it's um, the spouse or caregiver um, the children the parents of the care, the person who's diagnosed no matter how old they are um, friends um, I have, my husband has a couple of friends that for a couple of years, they 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 struggled. Um, so I think mental health and and again, what I'm learning is alternative therapies that can help with that. Um, healing touch. I'm just learning about acupuncture. I wish I, I knew everything that went along with that. I'm I'm brand new to the Cashman Center and and really just eager to learn um, because traditional medicine hasn't helped completely and. I know when Dave was sick and he was in so much pain, those really, really could have helped. And then when I look at um, my son, who's 13 and struggles with anxiety and depression, you know, every time a new sport starts and his dad's not there to coach him, um, Father's Day, my daughter, it's Valentine's Day. Um, you know, how can I get them through this? You know, we're on a roll and things seem good and then something comes up and and we're back down that road again. It's like starting all over. And you know, what are some other things that can help us? I'm very curious about meditation and my own, my own stress. It's incredibly stressful being an only parent. Um, my kids are at home right now. Um, and uh, you know, getting text messages before this started and hopefully, you know, everything goes well for two hours because I'm not checking my phone, you know? <laughs> it's a day-to-day -day thing, it's a constant. Um, I lost my job a week after my husband's funeral. Hmm. I was unemployed for six months. Um, a blessing in disguise, I was home with my kids. I'm a good budgeter, I was able to handle it. Um, but, you know, this is my fifth job in three years. And um, I believe God brought me here into the right spot and to Catherine Cashman. Um, but it's a long haul, long process. And um, it's, it's support of any kind, um, but knowing that there is more out there. And I was very vocal searching for anything when he was sick. We went and worked through the Angel Foundation, and they were wonderful. Um, but never did anybody tell me about these alternative therapies that could possibly help. I found out on my own for my son that 
when he is struggling with depression that keeping him on a sleeping pattern and a better eating pattern helps manage his depression better. Well, <laughs> there's nutrition counseling at the Cashman Center. Um, all, there's so many options. Um, I tend to see people at the very beginning phase of their diagnosis and treatment, and they're in crisis, and they don't know what to do, and they don't know where to turn, and all they have is us at the bedside with chaplaincy, and we also have um, healing touch and massage and acupuncture and things like that available in the inpatient environment. Um, but, but they need to unload on us or tend to unload on us and and um, in, in sometimes not the most appropriate way, and, and, and that's okay, because you're, you're in crisis, and, and our job, and we feel our job, is to, is to meet you where you are and try to get you to the next place so that you can find healing in your spiritual life, in your physical body, and, um, and try to, to connect you with the resources that we're talking about here tonight. So, um, you know, not knowing where everybody is in, in, in their lives. I can, I can say with honesty that um, I would love to, and I try to encourage people to not be quite so reactionary and help us help you with some of these um, alternative therapies and mindfulness, um, relaxation, um, those kinds of things. We've seen wonderful results from that in a short period of time if you're open to it. And I would encourage that. I might add that um, <clears throat> on the day I had, I met with a surgical oncologist that laid out my cancer for me, the prognosis, what it was, what we had to do, what was coming in my months of treatment. Somehow I had the wherewithal to say, okay, we're gonna do all that stuff. What else can I do to help myself through this? What's gonna make it easier for me? And he didn't hesitate. He said, healing touch and acupuncture. So I did it. And it made a world of difference for me. Um, I think we all know if we listen to our inner compass, what might be the right thing for you if you are actively searching and learning about things, I don't know, somehow it seems like our hearts guide us to the thing that might be most helpful. And that certainly was true for me.